Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. On May 21, 1924, the sons of two of Chicago's wealthiest and most illustrious families drove to the Harvard School on the city's south side and kidnapped a young boy named Bobby Franks. Their plan was to carry out the perfect murder. It was a scheme so devious that only two men of superior intellect such as their own, could accomplish it. These two were Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold. They were the privileged heirs of well-known Chicago families who had embarked on a life of crime for fun and for the pure thrill of it. Nathan Leopold, or Babe, as his friends knew him, had been born in 1906 and from an early age had a number of sexual encounters, starting with the advances of a governess and culminating in a relationship with Richard Loeb. He was an excellent student with a genius IQ and was only 18 when he graduated from the University of Chicago. He was an expert ornithologist and botanist and spoke nine languages fluently. Like many future killers, his family life was totally empty and devoid of control. His mother had died when he was young, and his father gave him very little personal attention. He compensated for his lack of fatherly direction with expensive presents and huge sums of money. Leopold was given $3,000 to tour Europe before entering Harvard Law School. A car of his own, and a $125 a week allowance. Richard Loeb was the son of the vice president of Sears and Roebuck, and while he was as wealthy as his friend was, Loeb was merely a clever young man and far from brilliant. He was, however, quite handsome and charming, and what he lacked in intelligence, he more than made up for in arrogance. Both of the young men were obsessed with perfection. To them, perfection meant being above all others, which their station in life endorsed. They felt they were immune to laws and criticism, which meant they were perfect. Loeb fancied himself a master criminal detective, but his dream was to commit the perfect crime. With his more docile companion in tow, Loeb began developing what he believed to be the perfect scheme. He also constantly searched for ways to control others. Leopold, who was easily dominated, agreed to join him in a life of crime. Over the course of the next four years, they committed robbery, vandalism, arson, and petty theft. But this was not enough for Loeb. He dreamed of something bigger. A murder, he convinced his friend, 
would be their greatest intellectual challenge. They worked out a plan during the next seven months. The plan was to kidnap someone and they would make it appear as though that person was being held for ransom. They would write the ransom note on a typewriter that had been stolen from Loeb's old fraternity house at the University of Michigan and make the family of the victim believe that he would be returned to them. Leopold and Loeb had no such plans, though. They intended to kill their captive. In May 1924, they rented a car and drove to a hardware store at 43rd and Cottage Avenue, where they purchased some rope, a chisel, and a bottle of hydrochloric acid. They would strangle their victim, stab him with the chisel if necessary, and then destroy his identity with the acid. The next day, they met at Leopold's home and wrapped the handle of the chisel with adhesive tape so that it offered a better grip. They also gathered together a blanket and strips of cloth that could be used to wrap up and bind their victim. Leopold also placed a pair of wading boots in the car because the boys planned to deposit the body in the swamps near Wolf Lake, located south of the city. They packed loaded pistols for each of them and looked over the already typed ransom note that demanded $10,000 in cash. Neither of them needed the money, but they felt the note would convince the authorities that the kidnappers were lowly, money-hungry criminals and deflect attention from people like Leopold and Loeb. They had only overlooked one thing – a victim. They first considered killing Loeb's younger brother, Tommy, but they discarded that idea. It was not because Tommy was a family member, but only because it would have been hard for Loeb to collect the ransom money without arousing suspicion. They also considered killing Armand Deutsch, grandson of millionaire philanthropist Julius Rosenwald, but also dismissed this idea because Rosenwald was the president of Sears and Roebuck and Loeb's father's immediate boss. They also came close to agreeing to kill their friend Richard Rubel, who regularly had lunch with them. Rubel was ruled out, not because he was a good friend to them, but because they knew his father was cheap and would never agree to pay the ransom. They could not agree on anyone, but did feel that their victim should be small so that he could be easily subdued. With that in mind, they decided to check out the Harvard Preparatory School, which was located across the street from Leopold's home. They climbed into their rental car and began to drive. As they drove, Leopold noticed some boys near Ellis Avenue and Loeb pointed out one of them that he recognized, 14-year-old Bobby Franks. He was the son of the millionaire Jacob Franks and a distant cousin of Loeb. Chosen by chance, he would make the perfect victim for the perfect crime. Bobby was already acquainted with his killers. He had played tennis with Loeb several times, and he happily climbed into the car. Although at their trial both denied being the actual killer, Leopold was at the wheel and Loeb was in the back, gripping the murder weapon tightly in his hands. They drove Bobby to within a few blocks of the Franks' residence in Hyde Park, and then Loeb suddenly grabbed the boy, stuffed a gag in his mouth, and smashed his skull four times with a chisel. The rope had been forgotten. Bobby collapsed onto the floor of the car, unconscious and bleeding badly. When Leopold saw the blood spurting from Bobby's head, he cried out, Oh God, I didn't know it would be like this! Loeb ignored him, though, intent on his horrific task. Even though Bobby was unconscious, he stuffed his mouth with rags and wrapped him up in the heavy blanket. The boy continued to bleed for a time and then died. With the excitement of the actual murder concluded, Leopold and Loeb casually drove south, stopped for lunch, and then drove for a little while longer. They had supper as they waited for the sun to go down. Eventually, they ended up near a culvert along the Pennsylvania railroad tracks. It emptied into a swamp along Wolf Lake. Leopold put on his hip boots and carried Bobby's body to the culvert. They had stripped off all of his clothes, and then, after dunking his head underwater to make sure that he was dead, they poured acid on his face in hopes that he would be harder to identify. Leopold then struggled to shove the naked boy into the pipe 
and took his coat off to make the work easier. Unknown to the killers, a pair of eyeglasses were in the pocket of Leopold's coat, and they fell out into the water when he removed his coat. This would be the undoing of the perfect crime. After pushing the body as far into the pipe as he could, Leopold sloshed out of the mud toward the car, where Loeb waited for him. The killers believed that the body would not be found until long after the ransom money had been received. With darkness falling, though, Leopold failed to notice that Bobby's foot was dangling from the end of the culvert. They drove back to the city and parked the rental car next to a large apartment building. Bobby's blood had soaked through the blanket that he had been wrapped in and had stained the automobile's upholstery. The blanket was hidden in a nearby yard and the boys burned Bobby's clothing at Leopold's house. They typed out the Frank's address on the already prepared ransom note. After this, they hurried back to the car and drove to Indiana, where they buried the shoes that Bobby had worn and everything that he had on him that was made from metal, including his belt buckle and class pin from prep school. Finally, their perfect crime carried out, they drove back to Leopold's home and spent the rest of the evening drinking and playing cards. Around midnight, they telephoned the Franks' home and told Mr. Franks that he could soon expect a ransom demand for the return of his son. Tell the police and he will be killed at once, they told Mr. Franks. You will receive a ransom note with instructions tomorrow. The next morning, the ransom note, signed with the name George Johnson, was delivered to the Franks demanding $10,000 in old, unmarked $10 and $20 bills. The money was to be placed in a cigar box that should be wrapped in white paper and sealed with wax. After its arrival, the Franks' lawyer notified the police, who promised no publicity. Meanwhile, Leopold and Loeb continued with the elaborate game they had concocted. They took the bloody blanket to an empty lot burned it and then drove to Jackson Park where Loeb tore the keys out of his stolen typewriter. He threw the keys into one lagoon in the park and the typewriter into another. Later in the afternoon, Loeb took a train ride to Michigan City, leaving a note addressed to the Franks in the telegram slot of a desk in the train's observation car. He got off the train at 63rd Street as it returned to the city and rejoined the waiting Leopold. Andy Russo, a yardman, found the letter and sent it to the Franks. However, by the time the letter arrived, railroad maintenance men had already stumbled upon the body of Bobby Franks. The police notified Jacob Franks and he sent his brother-in-law to identify the body. He confirmed that it was Bobby and the newspapers went into overdrive producing extra editions that were on the street in a matter of hours. One of the largest manhunts in the history of Chicago began. Witnesses and suspects were picked up in huge numbers, and slowly the perfect crime began to unravel. Despite their mental prowess and high intelligence, Leopold and Loeb were quickly caught. Leopold had dropped his eyeglasses near the spot where the body had been hidden, and police had traced the prescription to Albert Cohen Company, who stated that only three pair of glasses with such unusual frames had been sold. One pair belonged to an attorney who was away in Europe, the other to a woman with the third pair being sold to Nathan Leopold. The boys were brought in for questioning and began supplying alibis for the time when Bobby had gone missing. They had been with two girlfriends, they claimed, May and Edna. The police asked them to produce the girls, but the killers could not. Leopold claimed that he had apparently lost the glasses at Wolf Lake during a recent bird hunting trip. The detectives noted that it had rained a few days before, but the glasses were clean. Could Leopold explain this? He couldn't. Then two novice reporters, Al Goldstein and Jim Mulroy, obtained letters that Richard Loeb had written with the stolen typewriter, which had already been found in Jackson Park. The letters matched the type on the ransom note, which was a perfect match for the typewriter that Leopold had borrowed from his fraternity house the year before. Loeb broke first. He said that the murder was a lark, an experiment in crime to see if the perfect murder could be carried out. He then denied being the killer and claimed that he had driven the car 
while Leopold had slashed Bobby Franks to death. Leopold, however, refuted this. Finally, the boys were brought together and admitted the truth. Loeb had been the killer, Leopold had driven the car, but both of them had planned the crime together. They were both guilty of Bobby Frank's murder. The people of Chicago and the rest of the nation were stunned. It was fully expected that the two would receive a death sentence for the callous and cold-blooded crime. After the confession, Loeb's family disowned him, but Leopold's father turned to Clarence Darrow, America's most famous defense attorney, in hopes that he might save his son. For $100,000, Darrow agreed to seek the best possible verdict that he could, which in this case was life in prison. While the state is trying Loeb and Leopold, Darrow said, I will try capital punishment. Darrow would have less trouble with the case than he would with his clients, who constantly clowned around and hammed it up in the courtroom. The newspaper photographers frequently snapped photos of them smirking and laughing in court, and the public, already turned against them, became even more hostile toward the poor little rich boys. Darrow was fighting an uphill battle, but he brought out every trick in the book and used shameless tactics during the trial. He declared the boys to be insane. Leopold, he said, was a dangerous schizophrenic. They weren't criminals, he railed, they just couldn't help themselves. After this weighty proclamation, Darrow actually began to weep. The trial became a landmark in criminal law. He offered a detailed description of what would happen to the boys as they were hanged, providing a graphic image of bodily functions and physical pain. Darrow even turned to the prosecutor and invited him to personally perform the execution. Darrow's horrifying description had a marked effect on the courtroom and especially on the defendants. Loeb was observed to shudder, and Leopold got so hysterical that he had to be taken out of the courtroom. Darrow then wept for the defendants, wept for Bobby Franks, and then wept for defendants and victims everywhere. He managed to get the best verdict possible out of the case. The defendants were given life in prison for Bobby Franks' murder and an additional 99 years for his kidnapping. Ironically, after all of that, Darrow only managed to get $40,000 of his fee from Leopold's father. He got this after a seven-month wait and a threat of a lawsuit. Leopold and Loeb were sent to the Joliet Penitentiary. Even though the warden claimed they were treated just like all the other prisoners, they each enjoyed a private cell, books, a desk, a filing cabinet, and even pet birds. They also showered away from other prisoners and took their meals, which were prepared to order, in the officer's lounge. Leopold was allowed to keep a flower garden. They were also permitted any number of unsupervised visitors. The doors to their cells were usually left open, and they had passes to visit one another at any time. Richard Loeb was eventually killed by another inmate, against whom he had been reportedly making sexual advances. The inmate, James Day, turned on him in a bathroom and attacked him with a razor. Loeb, covered in blood, managed to make it out of the bathroom and he collapsed in the hallway. He was found bleeding by guards and he died a short time later. It was later discovered that Day had slashed him 56 times with a razor. When Clarence Darrow was told of Loeb's death, he slowly shook his head. He's better off dead, the great attorney said. For him, death is an easier sentence. Leopold lived on in prison for many years and was said to have made many adjustments to his character, and some would even say rehabilitated completely. Even so, appeals for his parole were turned down three times. Finally, in 1958, the poet Carl Sandburg who even went as far as to offer Leopold a room in his own home, pleaded his fourth appeal. Finally, in March of that year, he was released. He was allowed to go to Puerto Rico, where he worked among the poor and married a widow named Trudy Feldman Garcia de Cuevado, who owned a flower shop. He went on to write a book about his experiences called Life Plus 99 Years and continued to be hounded by the press for his role in the perfect murder that
that he had committed decades before. He stated that he would be haunted by what he had done for the rest of his life. Nathan Leopold died of heart failure on August 30, 1971, bringing an end to one of the most harrowing stories in the history of Chicago. Sending Leopold and Loeb to prison, according to many people, did not bring about an end to this macabre case thanks to two restless ghosts that continued to walk for many years afterward. The spirit with the most horrible connection to the case was that of Bobby Franks, who took nearly 50 years to find peace. During this time, visitors to Rose Hill Cemetery on the north side of Chicago often reported seeing the ghost of a young boy standing among the stones and mausoleums in the Jewish section of the graveyard. It is here where the Franks family mausoleum is located. Although its location is not listed on any maps of the cemetery and employees are instructed not to point it out to curiosity seekers. Even so, this tomb can be discovered within the confines of the beautiful burial ground. And starting in the 1920s, maintenance workers and visitors alike encountered the ghostly boy. Many came to believe that it was the ghost of Bobby Franks, unable to rest in the wake of his bloody and violent death. The boy was often seen wandering here, but only from a distance. Whenever he was approached, the apparition would vanish. These sightings continued for years, but eventually they seemed to fade away. It's been noted that the encounters ended at nearly the exact same time that Nathan Leopold died in Puerto Rico. Could there be a connection between these two events? It certainly seems possible, and perhaps Bobby Frank can now find peace on the other side. The other ghost from this case was that of famous attorney Clarence Darrow. When Darrow died in 1936, his ashes were scattered over the lagoon at Jackson Park, just behind the Museum of Science and Industry. While standing on what has been named the Clarence Darrow Bridge, many people have somewhat regularly spotted what is likely Darrow's ghost on a veranda that spans the back of the museum. This wide stone area is at the bottom of the steps leading into the rear entrance of the museum. The ghost is reportedly seen dressed in a suit, hat, and overcoat, and bears a striking resemblance to the attorney. The figure is reported to stand and stare out across the water before disappearing. Is this the ghost of Clarence Darrow, finally making his presence known from a world beyond our own? There are no ghostly manifestations connected to this site, and certainly none that look like Darrow did in his last days, as he strolled through the park, admiring the prettiest view on Earth. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Having barely escaped the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 when he was 19, shoe merchant Charles Lapham built his unusual winter home in Thomasville, Georgia, complete with at least 50 exits. 
construction began on this ornate Queen Anne-style mansion at 626 North Dawson Street in 1884 and was completed in 1885. The unique architectural touches include fish-scale shingles, a double-flue chimney, a walk-through stairway, a cantilevered balcony, and a unique hexagonal-shaped dining room. Lapham equipped the home with modern amenities such as a gas lighting system, hot and cold running water, indoor plumbing, and closets. Another unusual architectural flourish? The home possesses an overabundance of exits, the result, it seems, of Lapham's deep fear of fire and being trapped inside a burning building. There are at least 50 exits to the mansion, including 24 exterior doors for its 19 rooms. Many of the mansion's 53 windows are low to the floor and extend to the ceiling, providing additional ways out. In addition, the Lapham-Patterson house is noticeably asymmetrical. It contains just two true rectangular rooms and clean right angles rarely occur in its many windows, doors, and closets. For naturalists of the Victorian era, this skewed approach was healthy. The lack of right angles imbued the home with spiritual balance and harmony, or so they thought. Still suffering from post-traumatic stress and a fear of fire, Lapham made sure that his new winter retreat included plenty of ways to escape. But his superstition about the Great Chicago Fire didn't stop there. A decorative barge board hangs from the roof of the mansion, embellished with cut-out designs. In the center is the shape of a horned animal head. On the spring and autumn equinoxes of each year, sunlight shines through this opening and into a third-floor window, casting a bovine-shaped silhouette upon a small stage in the third-floor billiards room. Historians claim the cow is an homage to Mrs. O'Leary's cow, the infamous animal that allegedly kicked over a lantern and started the Great Chicago Fire that Lapham barely escaped from with his life. Perhaps Lapham intended the symbol of the cow as a way to communicate that he was prepared for any bad luck that might befall his second home. Though Lapham and wife Emma were Quakers, the pair harbored interests in seances and the occult. Of the three photographs that survive of Lapham, one is a spirit photograph with Lapham in the foreground, surrounded by the spirits of those who had passed away. Spirit photography was a common practice at the time. Mediums used darkroom manipulation to add additional images to an original photo. Lapham seems to have believed that being in tune with the spirit world would protect him from further harm. Sadly, Lapham's misfortune continued. He and Emma had five children while they lived at the Lapham Patterson house, but his daughter Lydia, whom they called Dolly, died, and two others were institutionalized for intellectual disabilities. Eventually, Lapham's business faltered, and his marriage similarly ended up on the rocks. Though they never officially divorced, Emma moved to Arizona with her living sons where she died in 1917 in an accidental fire. Lapham sold the house in 1894 to a James Larman, but shortly thereafter, Larman died of a heart attack on a business trip. His wife Harriet sold the house to the Patterson family. The new owners lived at the unusual abode until 1970. In 1975, the house became a National Historic Landmark and was opened to the public as a museum. Since then, staff and restoration workers have reported strange, unexplained activity. Some believe that the house is haunted by little Dolly, Lapham's daughter, who died after an illness in 1886. Lapham himself died in 1919 in San Diego. He was cremated, and his ashes were buried alongside his daughter Dolly in the family plot in Chicago. Today, you can visit the eerie Lapham Patterson house while in Thomasville, Georgia. From the multitude of doors to the flue system that resemble a firefighter's hat, it's impossible not to feel Lapham's otherworldly compulsions pressing down on you as you visit. Back when my mom was in the hospital, I stayed with her for about five days. 
She was on the sixth floor, whereas the food court and snack machines were on the basement floor. I live in a small town, so our hospital is the only place that has six floors. I went up and down the elevator so much that I knew this place like the back of my hands. Anyway, one day I was going down to get a drink and a Kit Kat. Everything was normal except the card reader on the Coke machine didn't work. I got on the elevator and selected the sixth floor. When I got off, there was just empty walls. No nurses' stations, no rooms, no painting, furniture, nothing. I walked towards one end to see random-sized white buildings and the other end to see tall skyscrapers and a shiny metal window-type building. I called out over and over, but no one replied. I went to the stop where the elevators were, and the elevators had disappeared. I took out my phone to call the hospital to tell them I was lost, but my phone didn't have any bars. I kept looking at the windows, hoping to find some sort of person that I could alert, but no one was down there, no cars for miles. After realizing that I was literally screwed, my panic attacks kicked in. I laid on the ground, staring at the wall, trying to calm myself down for half an hour. When I woke up, the place all looked the same, except for the elevators. They had somehow come back, and I felt a sigh of relief. I got in, pushed the fifth floor, which was the maternity ward, and the doors shut. When they opened, there was the basic light-colored walls, borders trimmed with little duckies and the sounds of people talking and babies crying. I found the fire escape and figured I'll take my chances on getting to mom's floor. I opened the door and I was back on the sixth floor, the real one. I walked into mom's room and she said, that was fast. I told her I must have been gone for over an hour, but she said I'd only been gone for less than five minutes. I looked at the TV and The Bold and the Beautiful was still on. It's a 30-minute show. I don't know what happened to me or where I was, but I still don't trust elevators. April 2nd, 1988. The day before Easter Sunday, a naked man with a dog collar around his neck leaps from the second-story window of a house in Kansas City's Hyde Park neighborhood. A neighbor finds the man crouched on his porch and calls 911. When police break open the unassuming white house on Charlotte Street, they find a torture dungeon like something straight out of a horror movie. Inside the home, the police found more than 200 Polaroid photos and detailed torture logs documenting the kidnapping, torture, and eventual murder of at least six young men, most of them male prostitutes, between 1984 and 1988. They also seized torture devices, an extensive library on witchcraft and the occult, a satanic ritual robe, and a human skull in an upstairs closet. That weekend, residents in the quiet neighborhood were awakened to the sound of the police excavating the home's backyard, where they found bone fragments and an additional human head. The house belonged to Robert Burdella, the man who would become Kansas City's most notorious serial killer. Prior to his arrest, Burdella was that serial killer cliché, someone neighbors described as a nice man who kept to himself. He helped start a neighborhood watch program, had worked as a chef, and ran his own booth at the Westport Flea Market. Called Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, the booth was a Kansas City fixture that sold everything from human skulls and shrunken heads to occult books and antiques. On the weekend that Burdella was captured, the Final Four tournament was happening in Kansas City and Berdella displayed four human skulls. Some say actual skulls, but more likely only models 
in the window of Bob's Bizarre Bazaar, along with a sign that read, The Final Four. In spite of the overwhelming and gruesome evidence found in Berdella's Hyde Park home, he was initially only charged with sodomy, felonious restraint, and first-degree assault. It took time for the authorities to realize the extent of Berdella's crimes because the majority of his victims' bodies were never found. The list of atrocities that Berdella perpetrated on his victims would not be out of place in a movie like Saw or Hostel, including applying bleach to their eyes with cotton swabs, injecting their vocal cords with drain cleaner, and gouging one victim's eyes out just to see what would happen. Once they were dead, he dismembered the bodies in his bathtub and put the body parts out for the garbage men. If his seventh victim hadn't escaped, there is no telling how long he would have gone on killing. Once Berdella's case became public knowledge, popular rumor would have it that he cooked and served some of his victims as food at his shop, though there is no actual evidence to suggest that actually took place. After his arrest, Berdella cited the 1965 film adaptation of John Foles' novel The Collector in which a man kidnaps a young woman and holds her captive in his basement as an inspiration for his murders. Berdella described his crimes as, my darkest fantasies becoming my reality. Berdella's own crimes inspired their share of movies, books, and even songs. A local radio personality wrote a parody song called, They Call Me Bob Berdella, to the tune of Donovan's 1966 hit, Mellow Yellow. The parody played on local radio stations, which also gave out prizes to listeners who attended events wearing dog collars. In one of the only interviews he ever gave before his death, Berdella expressed his displeasure over the songs and the media coverage of his murders, claiming that the media dehumanized him just as he had dehumanized his victims. Berdella referred to himself as the neighbor next door who reached a point in his life where he could do monstrous acts. That's not the same thing as being a monster, he said. Robert Berdella died of a heart attack in prison in 1992 after writing letters claiming that prison officials were not giving him heart medication. Other accounts have since implied that Berdella was poisoned while behind bars, but no official investigation of his death was ever conducted. For whatever reason, Berdella never attained the national notoriety of killers like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, or John Wayne Gacy. These days, he's largely forgotten about outside of Kansas City, but those who grew up around there can still remember where they were when they first heard about the Butcher of Kansas City. If you go to Westport Flea Market today, there is no plaque or sign to commemorate the spot where Bob's Bizarre Bazaar once stood, but most locals can still point it out. My weird darkness story started at my daughter's apartment. I fell asleep on the sofa with a blanket and my arms stretched over the top of my head. Suddenly, I was dreaming the exact same thing in my dream, with the same blanket, clothes, and even position of my body. And in my daughter's apartment, within seconds, I could feel something come in through her sliding glass door looming in the corner. That end of the couch became dark. I could hear growling and snarling coming from the same corner of that couch. All of a sudden, something grabbed both my wrists and was holding me down. Then the blanket began to hold me in and I could feel an evil presence pressing on the top of the blanket. It started at my feet and made its way up to my face. I was totally paralyzed with fear, thinking that whatever it was, it must not see my face. I tried prayer and pleading for God and Jesus to help me, but it blocked my thoughts and prayers. I was totally, physically and mentally paralyzed. Finally, my prayers and pleas for help must have reached the heavens because the evil presence and feeling disappeared. When I woke up, I was grasping at the air with my hands and could hear myself purging the word Jesus out of my mouth. A few other things have happened when I spent the night there. I often wonder if her apartment is haunted. 
but then again I have had other bizarre dreams in other places. Nightmares, really. The realism of the dreams is what makes it so awfully scary. It really felt like it was happening to me and there was nothing I could do about it. Winter has Louisville in its grip and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland a Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. I've lived in the same house in Alaska my whole life. It's a three-story house that is about 30 to 40 years old. Ever since I was a kid, I was constantly terrified in my house. Sometimes when I'm walking up or down my stairs, I get this sudden urge to run. I don't know why. I always feel as though I'm being watched, especially when I'm alone, but even when I'm not alone. My father died of cancer a little over a year ago in the house that I live in, but I have yet to have any signs of him lingering in my house, but my mom said on the one-year anniversary of his death, she woke up to him calling her name. Before he passed, he had said on numerous occasions he would try to open our back door and it felt as if someone was on the other side of the door holding the knob in place, preventing him from opening it at first. He said on one occasion he woke up because he felt a shove on his back, and when he woke up in his semi-dark room, he saw a line of different people he had never seen before standing by his bedroom door, and he would blink and they were gone. This happened when he was dying of cancer. Maybe he was delusional, or maybe he was slowly passing on and he was more vulnerable to the paranormal. I have also seen shadows moving along the wall. I have heard footsteps. I have also felt gusts of wind where there shouldn't be any. I do believe this house is haunted, but I have no idea how to prove it. This happened to me when I first moved out of my parents' place into an apartment in an older part of Chicago. I was looking for a job and took whatever I could get. I often felt as though I wasn't alone in that house. From my first night there, I knew there was something wrong with the place. A few weeks after I moved in, I started waking in the middle of the night and found that I was paralyzed. I now know this to be sleep paralysis, but at the time I thought I was going crazy. I would be awake for hours without being able to move, speak, or sleep. All I could feel was a tingling sensation in my body. A few weeks after this started, it stopped. Everything was fine until my sister stayed over one night. She went to bed early and stayed in my bedroom. I stayed on the couch. I slept well but the following morning, she came out of my bedroom crying. I asked her what had happened and she told me that she had woken up suddenly and found that she couldn't move, exactly as I explained. But she said a man was standing over her, talking to her in a strange language. She said the man had told her never to return to the apartment again. She was really freaked out and wouldn't stay in my apartment ever again. I thought she was probably exaggerating until a few months after that incident. 
I was lying on my bed asleep when I was shaken awake by someone. I found myself lying on the bed, paralyzed and couldn't move. It was the same as it had been a few months prior, but this time it was different. A man was sitting on the edge of my bed. In the darkness, I could make out his shape. He just seemed to be an outline, but he was certainly there. I could hear him mumbling away as though in prayer. Suddenly he turned and faced me, and that's all I remember. Was this a bad dream or did it happen? Has anyone else been paralyzed by a spirit? I'd like to hear from anyone else who has had a similar experience. I moved out of that apartment after that experience. I've never had anything like it happen since. I still wonder if I dreamed the whole thing. This took place several years ago when I was staying with a friend of mine, Monica, and her family in Maine. Her parents had a summer place out there and I would go with them quite often. We were in my friend's bedroom when I saw something walk past the window. This is a second floor bedroom so I was shocked to see something go past the window. I didn't get much of a look at it but I know it was completely white, pale even. After that, I tried to tell myself I hadn't seen anything. Monica didn't seem to be bothered by it, so we both spent the afternoon reading and talking together. The next day, we were outside, and I had forgotten about the bedroom incident. We were in the garden when I felt strange, sick to my stomach. I wanted to go inside straight away. Monica wanted to stay outside, but she gave in and we went back to her bedroom. I was looking out the window, and I saw him, a man standing in the garden wearing black with a black hat, looking up at me in the bedroom. He waved at me, and I saw his eyes. They were completely black. After the wave, he lifted the hat off his head and beckoned me to come to him. I stood completely still and did nothing. He stood there for a few seconds and then just faded away, still smiling. I didn't see him again, but I knew he was bad news. The way he waved at me was creepy. A few years later, I asked Monica about that incident, and she didn't seem to remember anything about it. She said that she had never seen any such man in that area. The neighbors were all families. There were very few older people in the area, so I have no idea who he was or what he wanted. I moved to Connecticut with my family around the time that I had started first grade. Soon after, I began seeing dark figures in my room at night you couldn't really make out any features other than that they had tall, broad shoulders and wide chests which made me think they were adult men. None of them had faces. They would pay no attention to me and walk around the room without interfering in anything I was doing. These events didn't happen every night, and the nights they did happen, I sometimes would have some very scary nightmares. At first, this was very frightening, but after I had seen that they would not hurt me, I grew used to them being there. One night was different, though. We had been living in the house for a little over three or four years, and I just climbed into bed and said goodnight to the figures which had become part of my routine. For the first time, one of them responded and said goodnight back to me. I was very startled from this, but I continued to talk to him. I don't remember the entire conversation, but what I do remember is that he introduced himself and told me that he wasn't there to hurt me. The spirit and I became good friends and I began to see him during the day. After a couple of years, he and I became so close that I allowed him to actually climb into my body. He had a term for this that I can't remember. After this happened, I stopped seeing the dark figures in my room. 
I and this spirit would still talk. I would think things and he would think them back to me. It became an addiction for me to spend time with him. It wasn't until I was about 17 years old that he began to use my body without my permission. Because of this, I got very upset with him and told him to leave my body. And I never saw him again. He just disappeared along with the other figures I used to see. A few months ago, I was antsy to get out of my condo. I decided to go out shopping and tried to lose myself in one of the stores. I'd recently broken up with my boyfriend and I just wanted to be lost and away from any of my problems. As I started to relax and get interested in the clothes I was looking at, I started to feel cold. I had chills and started itching. My whole body felt like one large bite. I felt sick but tried to ignore it. I was disoriented and I started to lose track of where I was and what I was doing. I decided I should go home. I left the clothes I was going to buy and left the store. In the parking lot, I struggled to find my car. It was very hard for me to move. All I remember is a car going past and standing in the middle of the lot trying to find my car. I think I must have looked like a lunatic. I felt sick to my stomach. My eyes were blurry, but I could see him an older man in black. He made me feel uneasy. I wanted to cry. I knew I didn't want to be close to him. As I stood there trying not to look at him, I could hear him screaming in my head, loud screaming. That was when I made eye contact with him. His eyes were completely black and he was smiling. I still felt completely out of it, but he was walking towards me it took all my effort to move. I remember trying to make a run for my car. That's all I remember. The next thing that happened was a bunch of people standing over me asking if I was okay. I could not comprehend what I had seen. Did I see anything? My mind just wouldn't let me take it in. As I began to catch my breath and calm myself as much as I could, the world around me was no longer black or fuzzy, but finally in focus. I think I met one of the black-eyed people. I have no history of delusion, I've never felt that way before, but I do believe I met one of them. Has anyone else had a similar experience? When I was in high school and was probably around 17, 18 years old, my friends and I were walking down the street in the dark. Now the street was well lit except for one section where the street light had blown out. We were a little nervous to go through this patch because it just felt eerie. As we reached the dark area, we noticed a white figure next to a mailbox. It was not a white figure. It was an old woman in a white nightgown just standing there staring at us. We figured as we got closer that it would disappear, but it did not. We ran away as fast as we could, even though her house was on the other side of the dark patch and made someone come and pick us up. Never been through anything like that in my life. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee.
When I was a small child in the years following World War II, very few people had or could indeed afford to own a car. The bicycle was the prominent form of transport for most ordinary people, and the ownership of a motorcycle was largely the province of the middle classes. Only the very well-off could enjoy the pleasure and freedom that a car would give as family transport, especially as the rationing of fuel was still in force. You'll then imagine the excitement when our father turned up one weekend with an MG Magnet touring car. The car was in beautiful condition and was painted in two complementary shades of green, a light grassy color above a deep dark racing green. The top of the roof was black, covered with strong oiled and varnished canvas, and a spare wheel with a luggage rack on the back gave the car a look of purpose. We kids loved the silvery spoked wheels and flowing wings, and its headlights and radiator grille gave the look of a cheery, cheeky face at the front. The car had the unusual feature of the doors opening in different directions, leaving a very big entry space, and the rear seats were higher than the fronts, so we kids always had a good view of the road ahead. Dad had scraped together 50 pounds to buy the car, a good amount in the late 1940s, and we were the only family in the street with our own car. It was in immaculate condition, and although built in the mid-30s, had been little used as the previous owner had perished in the war, and the car had been garaged and unused ever since. Dad had spotted it whilst talking to the owner's father about gardening, the garage being open as they discussed the rose bushes and lawn chatting over the garden gate. After having been given a close look at the car, the previous owner's father told my father that it had belonged to his son when he was at university before the war. The son had been given it as a 21st birthday gift by an uncle who had also promised him a position in his law firm after he had finished at Oxford. Sadly, Britain went to war with Germany before he finished college, and he quickly volunteered to join the RAF, where he trained to become a pilot based in the east of England. The car had been used briefly during his training and then garaged with his parents when he was transferred to a squadron based at Manston in Kent. Within a few months, he was thought to be dead, lost over the English Channel near to Dover, shot down defending the coast as a Battle of Britain pilot. His parents not being able to drive, the car had remained unused for eight years, but was carefully kept as they still hoped their son might turn up as a prisoner of war held in Germany. It was now accepted that he had perished after being shot down over the sea. Our dad was an expert on rose growing and over a few months the friendship had blossomed. I often went with my father to Mr. Bowen's house, and while the two men attended to the garden together, I enjoyed myself exploring the shed and garage, having biscuits and tea with Mrs. Bowen in their cozy kitchen, or sometimes sitting in the MG pretending to drive. To this day, I can still picture the big hexagonal dials on the dashboard and the quiet clunk as the doors closed. Dad loved the MG, too, and the Bowens recognized his enthusiasm. A deal was struck, as Mr. Bowen really wanted our family to have the benefit of the car, especially as my father had given so much of his time to their garden without asking for any payment. To us kids, it was a great surprise when the car was driven home. We had no idea it was coming at all. On the first Saturday, we all cleaned and polished the MG until it gleamed. It really did look very special and posh sitting on the front lawn. Dad had removed the gate posts to get it into the garden as he was worried about it being left outside on the narrow road. All along the street, neighbors peered from windows or suddenly decided it was a good time to walk to the corner shop. A couple of the bolder chaps actually came to admire the car and give their views on MGs versus other makers, even though neither of them were actually able to drive. Dad had driven during the war, but usually tank transporters and large trucks in the desert, although he had also experienced driving the General in his staff car from time to time. With petrol rationing still being in place, he had to drive the car carefully and without making any unneeded journeys, but as a special treat on our first Sunday of ownership, 
he and Mom arranged a surprise picnic for us at Bodium Castle, just over the border in Sussex. The car ran beautifully. Dad had only cleaned a few bits and bobs under the bonnet and checked the tires and brakes, but that was all that was needed. It was almost like driving a new car. It was very new to us, anyway. A year or so went by, and we remained the only family with a car. Sometimes Dad would take Mr. and Mrs. Bowen out, too, if they needed to get anywhere special or to bring large shopping items back to the house. It was on one of these journeys that the mystery started. Mrs. Bowen could only travel in the front of the car, as she quickly became travel sick if seated in the back. Early one morning, Dad had picked them up to take them a few miles to visit an elderly relative. As they made their way along the A259 Coast Road towards the seaside town of Folkestone, Mr. Bowen suddenly asked my father to stop and turn off the engine. The old chap sat in the back of the MG, listening very intently and with tears streaming from his eyes. He kept repeating softly, at ten o'clock, at ten o'clock, and rocking gently back and forth. My father climbed out from the driving seat and opened the door, asking Mr. Bowen what was the trouble. It seemed that as they drove along the road, a great feeling of fear had come over the old man. He had suddenly felt very cold and felt something lightly pressing on his shoulder as a weak but recognizable voice intoned, at ten o'clock, over and again in his ear. He described the sound as being very electrical and faint, like a badly tuned radio broadcast. My father wondered if he had maybe fallen asleep for a short while and started to dream, but the old gentleman insisted that he had not. They carried on with the journey, nothing more happening, and the incident was quickly forgotten and not talked about again. Several weeks later, we went out as a family, a day out to the beach at Dime Church, a small coastal village on the same coast road and to the west of Dover. As a family treat, it was a great success. We even had a cream tea and ice cream, a real luxury in the hard days following the war. The effects of the conflict were still apparent in the area, including the old concrete listening posts on the hillside overlooking the French coast. France was just 20 miles away across the channel. The barbed wire fences were also still in position in places along the beach. There were much more important things to do than remove the wire. British people were struggling to survive still, and essential work was being performed in other areas of life. We rambled about the Dime Church in the afternoon, relishing the sunshine and freedom of movement which had been denied for six years, and by the time we returned to the Green MG, all of us kids and mom were completely tired out. We traveled back through the country lanes, only rejoining the coastal road as the sun made its way below the horizon across the sea, a blaze of gold against the darkening skies. I became sleepily aware of a cold pressure against my leg, and without waking completely, told Toby to stop playing around. My young brother was always a fidget, and I was very sleepy. As I started to doze again, a tiny voice seemed to whisper into my ear. It's coming from ten o'clock, it said. Just that, no more. But it terrified me. I suddenly awoke completely, and it was as though a bright orange light was bearing down on me very fast as I opened my eyes. I froze completely and could not move, a feeling of great danger and fear taking me over completely, and I screamed out loud. Dad swerved to the side of the road and quickly comforted both me and Toby, who, frightened by my sudden scream, had burst into tears. Mom and Dad thought that I had fallen asleep and woken in the middle of a nightmare, and joked with me about having had a tiring day at the seaside. We had stopped close to a small roadside cafe, so more ice cream and fizzy drinks calmed us down before we went on our way home. We never had any trouble from the M.G., which we had all christened as a family, Maggie. Dad was very keen on checking everything out on the car every Sunday, topping up the water, dipping the oil, a job which I often did myself as it felt like being a real mechanic. Mom never learned to drive properly, but she did often have a go in the car. She was okay driving in a field or open space, but was very scared of driving with other traffic. Looking back, 
There was actually very little traffic in those days compared to these snarled-up roads today. One of the real pleasures of the car was receiving the friendly wave from other MG owners as we met them on the road. It was like an impromptu club, and we really felt that we belonged to something special. One summer afternoon, we had stopped at a country pub and were sitting outside enjoying lemonade when another MG drove in. This one looked very sporty as it was bright red and cream and was open-topped with just two seats and a wicker picnic basket fixed to the back. The driver parked alongside ours and within seconds was chatting to Dad about the cars. He actually recognized our car. It turned out that he had known young Mr. Bowen quite well when they were students together and had fond memories of the car, too, as they'd often taken girls out together in it to summer parties before the war. In fact, it had been the reason that he had almost bought an MG, although his one was a sporty PB midget. It looked far more exciting to me as it sat there without a roof and two tiny windscreens just like a real racing car. During the afternoon, he took my father for a short ride and they quickly became friends, as folks do with a common interest. His name was Rupert, and before many months had passed, we were calling him Uncle Bear after the Rupert Bear stories in Dad's newspaper. He told us many tales of his time at Oxford with David, our car's previous owner, and how they had toured down to the West Country together in the spring of 1939 when the seeds of war were growing in Europe. David had been passionate about doing something to help if push came to shove and war really started, and hoped to be joining the Air Force if possible, Rupert told us. We would sometimes all go out together, two lovely MGs and their passengers, heading out for a picnic, perhaps, or a day at the local races at Folkestone and stopping on the way back for tea in one of the villages. Dad was now working near Rye, a lovely ancient town which had originally been a famous coastal port until the sea had receded. Rye was now a couple of miles away from the coast, but was served by a tidal river and still had a full fishing fleet sailing from the quay. The drive to Rye is a lovely run along the coast from Hythe, following the edge of the Romney Marsh and cutting over the tracks of the famous Romney, Hythe and Dimechurch Railway, the world's smallest public train service, which serves the market towns and villages along the way. He would sometimes stop to photograph the lovely engines, each one a small, exact model of its full-size counterpart. The trains had run throughout the war, carrying supplies and also being armed with anti-aircraft and anti-tank guns to fight off the threatened invasion if it ever came. On one of these trips to Rye, driving along the coast road on a fine summer morning, Dad had felt the presence of somebody or something close to him in the car. Of course, and as you know, in England, cars are driven on the left of the road, and the driver sits on the right side of the car away from the hedge or pavement. He had this strange feeling of being accompanied for a good part of the journey, but put it down to the noise of the tires on the road, reflected back through the open window. Then, passing round a sharp curve, he was suddenly blinded by the full, low morning sunshine projected directly into his eyes. At the very same moment, he heard the words said loudly in his ear, It's coming from the sun directly at 10 o'clock. Dad felt the steering wheel being physically turned sharply to the right, and the car immediately speed up, and then hitting the curb on the right side of the road before coming to a fast, skidding stop in the open entrance to a farm drive. Feeling the shock, he looked behind and across the road to see a large and solid petrol tanker truck with steamy water pouring from its radiator and at the exact spot where he had heard the warning voice. Shaken, he got out of the MG and ran across to the truck. The truck driver was already out of his cab and sitting on the step with his head in his hands. Are, are you all right? asked father. What happened? The driver looked up and kept repeating, I am so sorry, I am so sorry, in a shocked voice. I'm so sorry. I could have killed you. My brakes failed as I approached the bend, and the lorry would not turn in fast enough to go around the curve. I thought I was going to kill you. How did you see me in time to swerve? Dad put his hand on the driver's shoulder to comfort him. I did not see you at all, he said. 
The sun was blazing directly into my eyes as I went around the curve. But I was warned, and somebody, or maybe something, seemed to take control of the car from me. It told me quite plainly, it's coming from 10 o'clock, that it steered me out of danger. Is your car damaged? asked the driver. And I hope you're not hurt either. This could have been so much worse. It seemed that no damage had been done to the car at all, but the lorry had knocked down several fence posts which had damaged the radiator and lights and had also burst a tire. They were both glad that nothing worse had happened. Dad took the driver into Rye, where he could find a telephone, report the damage, and arranged to get the lorry moved. He still felt shaken and, after calling into work, was promptly sent back home to recover. A few days later, Rupert came to see us all, bringing a new girlfriend, a young lady who had been an aircraft tracker at Manston during the war. Dad, of course, told the story of the near crash, and Grace listened very intently to the story. As Dad finished the tale, she looked away, with tears in her eyes. "'I must tell you,' she said, "'at ten o'clock is a term used by flyers to show the position of aircraft in the sky.' seen from the point of view of the pilot and using a clock face as reference. It seems to me that a pilot was warning you of the impending crash, indicating that the impact would be coming from in front of you and to the mid-left-hand side. Whatever, someone took avoiding action and saved your life that day. Rupert had listened closely to all of this, and his face had gone pale. Quietly, he said, David. David was looking over you and the MG2. He really loved that car and must be so pleased that you're taking care of it for him. David's spirit was taking care of you. There seemed to be no other plausible explanation, and our family has thanked the spirit of David the airman ever since that day. We all now believe in ghostly intervention. We kept the car in the family for many years. It was revered by all of us and it gave us much pleasure to be keeping it as David would have wanted. It passed through the family from person to person, kept spick and span, and was finally retired by us to Rupert as a gift as we felt that he was the closest person to David. The car still exists, and I have since seen it looking smart and well cared for at vintage car shows across England. Many years later, it still retains the MG number plate that it was originally registered with, and the headlights twinkle, and the grill still grins like a happy face, but which also has deeply secret knowledge. The mystery of the Gurning Man of Glasgow, who vanished into thin air, has never been solved. Was he a madman? An illusion? A visitor from another time or perhaps a parallel universe? Whoever he was, he certainly did strike fear into everyone who had the misfortune of encountering him. The first sightings of the Gurning Man took place in the late 1970s. Most of the encounters with this odd being took place in Glasgow, Scotland, around the district of Cross Hill, usually between 4 and 9 p.m., Suddenly, women started to report seeing a figure shaped like a human, but behaving as if he was insane. The sighting took place for three years, and many of the women were so traumatized that they left the area, moving to an entirely different place as far away as possible. One woman in her 50s, who lived with her husband and children, woke up in the middle of the night. She saw a something sitting at the end of the bed. It looked like a man who grinned at her in the most maniacal fashion while bizarrely rubbing his hands fast up and down his chest. She yelled and woke her husband who looked everywhere, but the creature had vanished into thin air. The sighting could have been easily dismissed as a nightmare, but it was just one of many reports coming from women who had no knowledge of each other. Just some days before the woman observed the girding man, two teenage girls had an equally horrifying encounter with chilling similarities, which they alleged took place less than 100 meters from the other witnesses' home. While walking home from a party, 
they noticed a strange man who they described as being aged in his late fifties, bald, extremely thin, and dressed in a tight black leotard. He was stood beneath a streetlight and appeared to be nervously moving on the spot with agitated actions. As the two girls approached the man, their sense of fear grew and they stopped talking so as to concentrate on moving past the odd figure as quickly as possible. As they passed, they could see from their peripheral vision that the man was pulling a bizarre, contorted expression, halfway between a smile and a pained grimace. The girls became nervous and frightened and started walking faster to get away from the man. One of them looked back to see if the odd man was following them, but was astonished to see that he had vanished from sight entirely. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Then there were more reports. In total, there were 17 reports of the Gurning Man made in the Cross Hill area of Glasgow between 1976 and 1979. Eleven of the sightings were made on the street, whilst the six other sightings were reported to have occurred inside someone's home. All witnesses reported seeing a man in his 50s. He was bald, very thin, and dressed in black. His movements were jittery, as though he were incredibly agitated. He was able to vanish into air within seconds. The mystery of the Gurning Man of Glasgow has never been solved. Who was he? Was he just a work of imagination? Or was he a real person? Was he mentally ill or maybe homeless? Some think he might have been a time traveler or perhaps a visitor from a parallel universe who accidentally entered our visible world. Whoever he was, he is still remembered and his name still evokes terror in Glasgow. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black-Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world spreading fear and terror have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The following is a creepypasta that does have some severe language. I've decided to leave it in in order to honor the author's intent. Listener discretion is advised. December 15th, 1985. Joram Bernstein. Well, time surely does fly. It's already been 40 years since my wonderful stay in Auschwitz. To my surprise, I'm not horribly tormented by the memories of that putrid hellhole of a prison like most people I have come to know during the time. Well, at least not anymore. Probably because 
In my perspective, it's best to forget. Well, not exactly forget, so to say, but rather to just make the best of everything with the life I still have. It'll never be the same again, but at the very least, I still have one. I mean, for Christ's sake, I stared right into the malevolent eyes of death itself with calm but cherishing smiles. When you're faced with an army of Nazi soldiers guarding the camp, pointing MP40s at you with bullets with your name on it, you tend to try to remain calm, do as you're told, and hope for the best. To my surprise, it worked. Although I don't know what worked more, the fact that I always remained calm or whatever monstrosity that intervened that some claimed to be a rogue angel. After the war ended, I moved to the U.S., hoping to get my mind off of this whole experience. A typical man's life. Story short, I was happily married, had two kids, Ellie and Jonathan, and then a divorce. Lost custody, and now have a whole house to myself while I drown in alcohol. Hell, if you thought what happened during the war traumatized me, well, allow me to be straightforward, it didn't. Why? Well, it's quite simple. I never had any attachment to any of my fellow prisoners. I always kept to myself, followed the guards' instructions, and never allowed any emotional connection with anyone. I know that sounds really callous, but during the time, you had to keep yourself numb and pray to God that you'd survive. As cold as this sounds, I had nothing to lose. Every man for himself, I guess. As I drank a glass of scotch that I have longed for since the time of day, I received a call from someone I wasn't familiar with. As I finished the last bit of my drink, I answered, "'Hello, Mr. Bernstein?' asked the unknown caller. "'Who is this?' My name is Daniel. I just need to ask you something. I did not have the energy to ask how he got my number or how he knew my name, so I complied. All right, I said in a tired, irritated voice. Listen, I'm working on a book about survivors like you, and I was wondering... I vaguely interrupted him as I knew what this was about. Let me guess, you want an interview with me about my story during the Holocaust, am I correct? Why, yes, sir, if that's okay for me to ask. I sighed heavily, rubbing my eyes from bitter annoyance, and told him my address. Go ahead and come in tonight. Are you sure? he asked. I have nothing else to do. Go ahead. I hung up. I could tell he was an anxious young man who aspired to get my story out there. This isn't the first time I've been asked for an interview, and it's certainly not going to be the last. Over the years, I never complied with anyone. Not that I was uncomfortable, but there was just nothing to tell. I learned to burn those memories away, and to simply move on from whatever hells I've witnessed. Besides, whatever I have to say, he probably has heard it before, so why not just get this interview over with? About two hours later, he arrived on my doorstep. I let him in without him knocking. He took his hat off and politely said, Hello, Mr. Bernstein, I'm Daniel Adams. Pleased to meet you. He held his hand out for a handshake. Likewise, I replied. I welcomed him into my home and led him into my office. He was dressed quite nicely, I should add. He had an obvious smile on his face, as if this was his first interview for his new book. His smile faded away instantly when he noticed my personal library. He began to shake a little when he hesitantly asked me, "'So you're studying demonology, the occult?' I turned around and embarrassingly chuckled, "'Yes, just personal research.' Behind my dusty desk sat a massive crimson shelf filled with books, journals, and documents about the occult and the nature of the paranormal." On the wall beside the shelf was pinned a little old sketch of a blurry monster I made several years ago. He nervously smiled as he pulled out his pen and paper. I apologize if this makes you uncomfortable, I said. We can go in another room if you like. Oh, no judgment here, he replied as he scratched his head, nervously smiling. It's just a little unexpected to see that many books about demonology in one room. 
Before I could speak, he stared down to the ground like he was ashamed. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have asked. I leaned towards him and said, I'm normally not a patient man, but you're young and I have a lot to learn, so I'll let that slide. He looked up at me and revealed that nervous smile once again, ready to write. I asked, so, what do you want to know? How did you feel during the time? Again, his eyes lingered upon the ground, ashamed of his question. I gently placed my hand on his shoulders. Son, it's okay. What happened was a long time ago. Feel free to ask me any question you like, okay? He looked upwards with a distant smile regaining focus. All right, to answer your question, I didn't know what to feel. I cleared my throat. To tell you the truth, I was numb the entire time I was there. The horrible things the Germans did didn't affect you? He asked in a voice more concerned than confused. At first they did. Mostly when I was in the departure train on the way there. What was that like? It was treacherous. There were at least 30 of us in one car for five days. Very little rations and water. No bathroom. Not even a little porthole-sized window to look through. Almost complete darkness every day and night. It was during the winter as well, and with the little clothing I had on, I hardly slept at night. During the day, I say I got an hour total because the rest of the hopeless prisoners moaned in disbelief that we were here. I heard a few choke out as their lives slowly faded away from dehydration. I always hid in the corner with my knees tucked against my chest, hearing all these haunting wails screaming for death to come and take us all. I remained silent as I drifted into the corner. I think that was the first time I cried as well. I took a deep breath after I spoke. Mistaking my tone for discomfort, Daniel asked me, are you okay, Mr. Bernstein? Yeah, I'm okay. I just need a drink. I cleared my throat again. Anyways, it was horrifying, but the only reason why I'm still alive is because I always kept to myself. If a guard gave me an order, well, if you were smart, you did what he said, or you would be shot, or worse. Daniel was puzzled. What do you mean, worse? I poured another glass of scotch before I spoke. You see, the Nazis were ruthless. When you're in the camp as a prisoner, they could not give two shits about you. To them, you're a waste of skin. God's mistake, made for disposal. They completely disregard the fact that you're a human being. It didn't matter who you are, whether you're white, black, or any other color in the rainbow, male or female, or even a child. Unless you're proven to be a good use for manual labor, They'd kill you in any way they pleased. As Daniel wrote everything I stated, he began to shake. Wait, even children? He said in a really faint tone. I took another drink from my glass. Yes, I've seen toddlers and even newborns thrown into pits of fire. Oh my God, their screams. See, this is where I started to become numb from the whole thing. Even after the mothers witnessed their children burning into a crisp, they'd shoot them and burn their corpses in the same pits just because they could. I could still hear their screams in my sleep. As I filled another glass, I said, I'm sorry, it's one of those few things that really haunt me, even to this day. Daniel put down his pen and paper anxiously. Oh my God, I I'm sorry. We can stop now if you want. Now... It's okay. I needed to talk about that. I just need a moment. I took a deep breath and regained my train of thought. All right, where was I? Oh, yeah, that was only the beginning. It was like the first circle of hell itself. Worse was yet to come, and even after being emotionally numb, I still wasn't ready. During my whole experience for my four years of imprisonment, I'd say I spoke maybe a total of ten words. When they gave me orders, I did exactly that. Most of the time it was a struggle, but I did what I could to stay alive. With the very little rations and water we were given, I nearly strained myself until dawn, but I was still alive. 
They specifically chose me to handle certain tasks as they did with anyone else they saw fit. I wasn't holding my breath, however. They could shoot you for target practice at any time, even while you were working at any time. In most cases, they'd gather a large group, only to be placed in gas chambers. Oh my God, the screams again. Even behind closed doors, you could still hear their screams as they suffocated to death. Daniel began to get angry. Those sick bastards. How could they do that? He gripped his pen tightly. Because they could. And because they could, I almost died. I was selected for execution because my time was up. I was against a wall with rotting corpses surrounding me. I thought their reeking flesh was the last thing I'd ever smell. The terrified faces of my fellow prisoners. The sinister smiles on the guards' faces. I thought that would be the last thing I'd see. They fired, killing everyone except me. Somehow I was still alive. Not a single bullet hit me. I kept my eyes closed and held my breath and pretended I was dead. As awful as this sounds, I could feel blood smothering me. I used it to my advantage. Oh, God. This was when I almost truly died. I would much rather have been shot, but since they thought I was dead, they were about to dispose of my body in the pit of fire. Daniel suddenly stopped writing and looked at me confused. Wait, you said you were still alive because you kept to yourself, right? Right. And you're saying they almost executed you and burned you alive, right? Well, if that was the case, how did you escape? You're giving me two different stories. Ah, shit, I thought to myself. This kid pays attention. I, I guess I gave myself away on that one, huh? He got his pen and paper ready once again. What really happened? How are you still alive? I hesitated for a brief moment. I'm gonna need another drink for this. As I poured my last glass, I could feel his anxiety. He knows there's something I left out on purpose. He knows there is a truth that I didn't intend to tell. Well, he will know why my truth was hidden. Look, what I'm about to tell you is completely true, and I do not plan on going to a mental institution. He looked at me as if I was delusional. What do you mean by that? So, obviously, you see all those occult books here, right? You'll soon come to the realization as to why I do, but you have to swear to me that you'll believe every word I say, okay? I'm not crazy. Daniel appeared afraid. This is the part of my story that really fucked me up, and I have a good reason why I never talked about it with anyone. You're the only one I'll ever tell this to. I sighed. Ask any survivor of Auschwitz and they will all give you the same reaction, same expression, and same fear. They are all too terrified to tell the tale. So, Daniel, I know how this sounds, but you have to believe me, all right? He nodded yes while he began to shake. I could see a speck of sweat on his forehead. So what happened? All right, here goes. I took a deep breath. So there was this one prisoner who we all talked about during our time. We didn't know his name or his number for sure, but I believe it was Bruce. He was a really vengeful character. Rumor had it that he was somehow possessed or something. He occasionally attacked the guards, but the funny thing was that they wouldn't kill him on the spot. I saw him rip out someone's throat in front of an officer, and all they did was pin him down. I saw him rip out a piece of someone's rib cage and shoved it down his throat with brute force. I saw him take a man's gun and empty a clip into his face. Man, he was one strong, angry bastard. Daniel stopped me. Wait, he killed a few guards? That would be an understatement. He brutally mutilated them. Well, if that was the case, why didn't they kill him, especially if he was a threat to them? I don't know. 
It's like they were expecting it, testing him somehow. I heard one officer say, perfect. Even to this day, I wish they had somehow killed him. I finished my drink. Daniel grew even more anxious. One day, he charged up to a guard, tackled him to the ground, and brutally beat him until his head was battered. That's when they finally decided to execute him. After four murders, they finally decided enough was enough, which was quite odd. I know it sounds strange and abnormal, but there was something about him they found fascinating. It took five guards to restrain him. An officer smiled and shot him in the heart. Even after that, he was still somehow alive. They dragged him to a flaming pit and tossed him in. I hesitated to tell him the rest. And what happened after that? he asked. I stared at him for at least a minute before speaking. Look, I really don't like talking about this. I took another deep breath. So, before they almost threw my body into the pit, I heard shouting and women's screams. It was so grotesque. They dropped everything they were doing, including me, as I lay there pretending to be dead with my eyes barely open. I could see five guards restraining the violent prisoner. His face was covered in blood, and he had an eager smile as the officer approached him. I could hear what they were saying. The officer said, what a waste, you were so perfect, but it looks like you're no different, false hope for a flawless creation only to fail like all the rest. No matter, there'll always be others of your kind. The prisoner gave a sinister laugh and replied, when I get out of here, I'll find you, dismember your flesh piece by piece and feed it to your battered face while your family watches. He then spat blood in his face. The officer punched him and shot him point-blank in the heart. Toss him into the pit, he said. I took a deep breath yet again. Daniel was nervous, but very intrigued. So what else happened? I sat there for a moment before I finished my story. They completely forgot I was lying there, so I stood up and hid behind a building. I know that was very reckless and would have gotten me killed for sure, but what happened next? Oh, dear God. I paused before continuing on. As they threw his body into the pit, I could hear him screaming, such agonizing pain. But there was something peculiar about him. The more he screamed, the more distorted it became. Each scream was an octave lower than the last, and the volume progressed until it came to the point where it was monstrous and unbearable to hear. And suddenly, it stopped. It was like he absorbed the flames and he let out a demonic screech, gushing blood, which looked like a fountain of crimson. Oh, my God. He didn't appear human anymore. His eyes illuminated pure white. His arms were covered in scales, to best describe it. They were as black as night, with fang-like spikes that glowed blood red with claws that took on the same color and shape. He had large, angelic wings that looked mystic. The wings were there, but it's like they made the illusion of mist, black fire. I can't even describe it. The next thing I knew, he attacked the surrounding guards swiftly. In quick moves, he butchered right through their flesh. I know this sounds crazy, but I saw him forge a giant scythe out of their blood. It was like he defied the laws of physics and somehow made a solid, sharp weapon. Demonic magic, to best describe it. More guards came after him, and he took incredibly long and fast steps towards them and slashed right through them. At one point, when a guard was in a pool of blood trying to run from the creature, the prisoner somehow created a thick spike that rose from the ground, impaling him from his anus out of his mouth. I don't know what he was doing, but it, it was like he could manipulate blood in any way he wanted, like he could control it at will. Clearly, their weapons were useless against him as he forged the scythe into a spiraling longsword. Can you just imagine the dread they felt 
as the last thing they saw were those glowing, malevolent eyes with that demonic laugh mocking their pain as he slaughtered them like helpless animals. It was literally a bloodbath. He brutally mutilated at least 15 guards before flying away. The oddest thing, he specifically targeted the Nazi guards. No prisoner was hurt, not even a scratch on those who were nearby. It was like he unleashed all of his personal hell only to hunt down and murder those that caused his pain. Daniel was baffled and shook with fear. So he just turned into some kind of monster and killed all those people? He stared at me like I was a madman. I know how it sounds, but it's the truth. What he did to those guards truly traumatized me. I see, Daniel said softly. He closed his book, and he asked me one last question. So how did you escape? After the creature fled, the rest of the guards panicked and ran away as well. They burned all evidence of our documents, their whereabouts, and left us for dead. It was the Americans that discovered the camp, and of course they came to our aid. Daniel continued to look at me in disbelief. I'm sorry, Mr. Bernstein. I don't know. Are you sure you know what you saw? I became furious with his question. In anger, I replied, Listen, kid, you don't know what it was like down there. You don't know what it was like to watch little children burn right in front of your eyes. I've seen the Nazis pile bodies in a truck only to bury them in a trench. I raised my tone. I know what I saw. I have devoted my life to find out what the creature was. That's why my family left me. That's why my kids were scared shitless. They thought I was mad. They thought I was as crazy as my stories when I got all those books trying to find out what the fuck this thing is. Ask any other survivor or any other Bernstein that could tell the same story. They are too fucking terrified to tell the truth. So before you start calling me crazy, you might want to be a little more understanding on what I have fucking witnessed. Do you understand me? Okay, okay, I understand. I got the chance to calm down as I sat on my chair. I poured myself another glass and softly said, Look, I'm sorry I screamed at you. I know this doesn't make any logical sense, but I know what I saw, and it was real. You really screwed me up, but I am not crazy. Daniel calmed down as well. It's okay, I, I understand. He politely asked, Did you ever find out what this creature was? No. I couldn't find anything that even closely resembled what I witnessed. Whatever it is, however, I have no doubt that it's still out there, and it's hungry. Daniel grew nervous once more. Mr. Bernstein, I have a confession to make. My grandfather was a Nazi soldier, but I strongly disagree with his actions and his views, and, and that's why I'm writing this book. But this monster, you said he specifically targeted men like him. If I'm related, does that mean I'm next? Well, I highly doubt he'll try to hunt you down for that reason, but just in case he confronts you, just don't tell him about your grandfather. From what I've seen, he doesn't kill innocent people. Just don't piss him off. And above all, whatever happens, do not bleed. Daniel had enough and gathered his gear and walked out the door. Thank you for your time, Mr. Bernstein. I must be going now. Have a good night. All I did in response was lift my glass and softly said, Cheers. I knew he was terrified, but at least he listened to my story. I know what you're thinking. How could this be real? The textbooks would have described this. Oh, please. Those damn history books never reveal secrets that weren't meant to be told to the world. However, that's the problem. Nobody knows who this creature was. Where did he come from or why he was there? All I know is that he's angry, inexplicably powerful, and kills any Nazi that crosses his path. With that motivation, I still remain unsure whether he was a brute vigilante 
or just a beast lusting for blood. As a storm approached, it began to rain unnaturally hard. Seeing my old sketch of the figure I had made a long time ago, hoping I would find anything like it, I approached it with a smile while finishing my drink. As I stared right into those hypnotic white eyes, I asked myself, what the fuck are you? Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.